Hi, everybody. We're going to give it one more minute and wait for a few more uh, stragglers to join, and then we will get started. Okay, so everyone, welcome to the equipment tracking webinar powered by QuickLink. On the agenda today, we're going to take a little bit of time to give uh, the about us um, section. You're going to learn about QuickLink and who we are. After that, we're going to do a market overview, dive into some use cases, then we'll go into the product section of the webinar which you're probably most interested in, uh, solutions, accessories, and we're gonna end it with Q&A. So I'm Jody Ward, and with me, I have Manny Hernandez. I'll give a quick introduction. Manny is the VP of North America at QuickLink. He has been in the industry for ever, no, I'm teasing, for about 18 years. Uh, he started his career though in the Marines, working in logistics. Then he attended Hartford and got his MBA at Edinburgh Business School. So he is a cultured chap, if you will. I am Jody Ward. I'm the Director of Channel Sales in North America for QuackLink. And I did my undergrad at UCLA. I have about 12 years of wireless experience, seven of those being specifically in telematics. And I've led tens of thousands of device deployments, so if you need a map for help mapping out a custom project, uh, perhaps trying to figure out how to integrate it in the cloud, whatever it may be, then I'm your gal. Reach out, don't be shy. So let's get started on the content. Thanks, Jody. And a little bit about us before we get started. Uh, QuickLink has been around since 2009. We actually started out as a, as a very small module company and kind of grew out to do finished product. Um, today, we have approximately 52 million devices in the field and support approximately 3,800 customers worldwide. Um, we became a public company in about 2017 and grew to a market cap of $1.4 billion. And that's a, a huge, huge impact and growth. Um, overall, we support the, the, the company's uh, vision and mission to be one of the uh, premier wireless manufacturers and we've done so. We last year named uh, the second largest in the world uh, for uh, manufacturing telematics. And so uh, that's something we're super proud of. Um, of course, the difference in experience between a company to company varies. Um, here we have over 500 employees, over almost 80% of them have an engineering capacity. And it, it really lends uh, some kind of um, lends value to our customers as we're able to navigate their solutions and get them through really complex topics pretty quickly and affordably. Um, one, of the, one of the things that sets us apart is that almost any country you go to, you'll find that we have, and we are a uh, certified product in every country that we get into. Here in the States, we're no different. We have FCC, we have PTCRB, and of course, Jody's helped us out tremendously getting approved with the, the carrier groups. Um, of course, this is something that um, we pride ourselves on. So here in North America, we have a huge support team to help support uh, our down channels, our distributors, our, uh, our, our VARs, um, you know, just getting started is something that um, a lot of companies have a lot of hurdles with. Here we have a huge and wide sprawling uh, solutions team that is here to help. Uh, in addition to this team that you see here, we have huge teams in China and in Mexico City where Fernando is actually uh, our global technical director has been instrumental in helping us um, with support and giving us the tools we need to thrive here in the States. Um, it's in, in addition to this, um, we have our leadership team uh, with Alejandro Patino, our, our global vice president of sales, 
um, who's given us the support and the uh, and, and uh, the tools that we need to uh, to also thrive here. Uh, and of course, Adam Lau, our CEO. So here I operate from the San Diego area. I actually specifically work in the Temecula office. We have one in Carlsbad, if you're familiar with the area. We're in Southern California. Um, we have also offices uh, in Canada. And as I mentioned, Mexico City, which is a huge, uh, huge help to us here in North America as they work on the same time zone. They're able to support us with some of the nuances that we run into. And then of course, um, we're headquartered out of Shanghai where we have a, a, a very large and sprawling resource uh, in the R&D departments. We have three R&D departments, in fact, where we have hundreds of employees working out of Shanghai, Hafei, and Shenzhen. Um, of course, we cover the map with support, and this includes Latin America. Um, it includes our recent office edition in the UK, but also we have the Croatia office, Denmark, um, the, the MEA office, and out of India, and of course, we support Australia. So in the market, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have 52 million devices and the breakdown of those devices um, range from anything from a micro mobility solution in scooters all the way through dry vans and trailers and kind of anything in between. One of the growing segments has been asset tracking and of course, ODM, OEM projects. It used to be that vehicles were one of the lion's shares of the tracking industry, but that's not the case anymore. We've seen an emergence with uh, with just, just different types of solutions um, from equipment to off-road equipment, um, agriculture equipment, uh, micromobility, compliance, cargo, logistics has been an increasing uh, um, uh, segment for us. And we continue to see these other emerging items and even think beyond that, like healthcare. Um, we see these emerging uh, use cases in the field. So that takes us over to the equipment industry. And we'll touch very briefly on what that means to us in the equipment market. Um, year over year growth in the equipment market over the last 10 years has, has seen a tremendous, uh, or actually a, just a very linear growth pattern over the last 10 years. And this is year over year additional revenue uh, captured by the overall equipment market. And this is in partly due to construction um, and it's projected to uh, actually in 2020, we saw a contraction. Everybody across the board saw a contraction in market uh, market demand. Um, there was uh, economic ties that that uh, weren't very helpful in 2020. So we saw a big dip there. And now what we're finding is that we're getting out of those dips, um, and we're looking to meet or exceed surpassed numbers from pre uh, pre pandemic levels. Um, so we'll start seeing that in 20, the end of 2023 and then mid 2024, both construction and rental will, will come out of those dips and continue their trajectory with an annual compounded ag annual growth rate of approximately two to three and a half percent. And we'll look through that all the way through 2027 and beyond, probably 2029. Um, drivers that are that are that are pushing this market are uh, the, the increased um, investment that the government is making in infrastructure here in North America, at least in the United States. We have the infrastructure bill where we are rebuilding um, some of the old legacy infra infrastructure and you're seeing a bigger demand in equipment. Um, you're also seeing a demand uh, being pushed by uh, regulatory compliances, things that like uh, cross state lines. Um, think of the California, um, Washington, uh, Illinois, New York, um, those those states are passing legislation that are going to help. They are going to require certain reports and certain electronic reports, and those will be the, the main drivers going forward. So I guess that takes us to agriculture. Oh, so for the agricultural side of the equipment market, uh, it's already recovered from COVID. So it did see that dip in. 2022, 2021, but it's already recovered and it's expected to grow quite steadily over the next decade. Uh, the compound annual growth rate was 3.3% and the global value is 106 billion right now. Uh, the drivers for, for this are population growth. We gotta make food to feed all the people. Uh, there's also advancements in technology that are pushing this forward. And of course, government subsidy to feed those populations. Thanks, Jody. And that moves us to solutions and those common challenges that happen within the solutions. And so I'll take the first one here in revenue loss. And what we what our products 
uh, help people do is um, is capture the missing revenue usage through through usage based analytics. And when you think about this, think about the the rental industry. Um, for example, uh, they'll get the phone call to stop the clock. Meanwhile, the end user may continue to use that equipment until they actually pick it up. And so this is missing revenue that is not captured by the rental companies. And it's something I feel that we help, uh, we help answer the call to when they implement these types of solutions. In addition to that, we have uh, when people actually own their own assets and they're using it on, on a construction site, there's almost nothing that stops an employee from taking that home and using it for their personal use or make doing some side jobs. So it's good to know um, it's good to know these things so that you know understand your utilization and you're able to do something about it. And for utilization, uh, not knowing your equipment utilization can have a significant impact on your financial performance as a company. Um, for example, I'll show you how. Uh, if you have idle equipment at job site A and you have 12 job sites across the country, um, and you don't know about this underutilized equipment, if you max out at another site, you might have to purchase more equipment because you're not clued into idle equipment sitting there. So it allows you to reallocate assets as required. Um, and it prevents you from either, I think when most people are faced with this challenge, uh, they do one of three things, right? They're going to, one, uh, extend their project deadlines, which gives them a terrible reputation in their industry, especially if you're a contractor, uh, which would hinder future earnings. Um, and then, or they'll have to replace the, the equipment or buy more equipment rather, because they don't know that they have idle equipment somewhere else. And the third thing is they're gonna have to spend more in repairs because they don't track the engine hours of the machines. They don't get those maintenance, regular maintenance updates. Right, right. And maintenance is one of those things where, you know, that's the lifeblood of your revenue sometimes. When, when equipment goes down unnecessarily, it's because it wasn't planned right. And I think uh, a lot of the times, operational readiness is how you make sure that things keep moving uh, effectively. And the best part about planning uh, maintenance is that you know when brakes are going to fail, you know when you're supposed to stock the O-rings and the, the nuts and bolts to keep things together, you can do the preventive maintenance thing. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of people practice. I practice it myself when I was in the military, uh, we would have a, uh, a, a shelf of, of parts that we knew that were going to be worn out, right? Consumable parts that uh, you would expect, like the O-rings, like I said, the, the gaskets, um, brake pads, just common things that go wrong, you know when the influxes are going to go higher and lower due to the, due to the amount of um, uh, hours it's been on or how many miles it's been driven. Um, the only thing that, that can only prevent, uh, you know, the, the, the only thing that could prevent your equipment from going down is obviously being prepared for those maintenance events, unless, of course, your stuff has been stolen. Great. Right. So theft and loss, we all know that's a big challenge. Um, and thieves are alarmingly sophisticated these days. I mean, uh, they have technology that is like GPS jammers, for example, um, radio frequency scramblers, uh, the whole nine. So that is always going to be a challenge. Luckily, our devices have GPS jamming detection. Uh, we also also have a new solution that we just launched that I'll detail later on. But um, and for loss, that's got to be the most frustrating out of all of it. If you actually already own the equipment, but you've misplaced it because you're tracking it on paper, um, human error is inevitable. Uh, so again, a lot of businesses are forced to replace equipment to finish a project deadline if they have to meet. They can't wait to find it. And human error, as I said, tracking on paper is detrimental to your business instead of using analytics and data from a device. Right, and analytics is one of those things that uh, it's a difference between walking with your, looking at your feet and then look, picking up your head and looking ahead of where you're walking at. Um, a lot of uh, C-level groups or people that are responsible for the finances of a group uh, really need to understand the revenue loss, the utilization, the maintenance and the theft and loss all under one uh, one purview, and our devices enable that for companies. Um, so when they do, when they aren't able to make 
uh, good KPIs, they're able to, to reach the efficiency that leads to better operating revenues. And I think from a CFO pers perspective or, or an accounting manager or controller's pers perspective, um, it's easier to also uh, identify the devices in the field. So if you have multiple sites, being able to touch those devices uh, just leans into the accounting. And so that takes us to the product portfolio. How do we keep track of everything uh, that we just talked about? Well, we have from left to right, we have uh, a sprawling portfolio. And this is only just part of the portfolio for the United States. And we have a global portfolio of literally hundreds of products um, that are, that are uh, hyper effective in ensuring that you know where things are at, where they're going, and how they're being able to be used. And, and think about the light duty things that we consider light duty. You can actually use those in heavy duty equipment. And I'll give you a good example, the GB130MG. And we'll talk about four devices later on, but I'm gonna highlight GB, GB130MG uh, before we get there, because it's really one of those universal devices that you can put into almost any piece of equipment. You wouldn't normally say that about a device. And I feel like this is uh, one device that is universally used. Um, you get a lot of analytics out of it, um, but then move over to the heavy duty side. You can use some of this stuff for the light duty stuff as well, because it's like a, a Swiss army knife. You're able to, um, you're able to do so much more with it. I mean, Jody will go over the 620 and the uh, GB350 later on, but uh, we also have camera solutions, uh, routing solutions, and of course, uh, the asset management solutions. And these are things that are going to help you um, identify where a product is. Above all else, one of the things that I'll mention that we won't talk about too much in this one is the embedded solutions. You could take almost any one of these devices and put it into something that you're building. And I think that's really special about what we do. Um, here at QuickLink, we are a development house. We have R&D facilities. We have almost 80% of our staff of our, I think it's more than 500 people uh, are actually engineers that can help embed this technology into something that's being made. And I think that's very special about what we do. I think it lends value to other people's use cases and helping you guys enable mobility within your, within your uh, products and for your down channels and your markets. And it helps also gain other sources of revenue for our down channel as well. Okay, I'll take the top four. Um, for recovery, for use cases, uh, as I mentioned before, thieves are getting much smarter. Uh, recovery is the primary, I would say, use case when everyone thinks of a GPS device, right? So, um, and I mentioned before, thieves are getting smarter. So make sure to uh, protect your assets, especially the ones that are already on wheels on a trailer, make it especially easy to steal. Um, in the service industry, they've done uh, taken a slightly different approach and they've elaborated a bit, but I think the most uh, popular use case in the service industry is improving safety metrics. So they're monitoring driver behavior um, and they're also validating service was rendered using the system. So uh, if you're a snow mo or a snow removal company or a street sweeping company, for example, um, you can attach the PTO wire on our device to the the plow and the brush to see when it's lowered or when the brush is in use and give the municipality a real time view of which streets have been serviced and that you know a city might post that on their website so its constituents know which roads are safe to drive on so it's really creative. Um, and then regarding powered assets in the snow removal space, I have another brilliant customer and they have integrated our device into several industrial salters, uh, the salters that go out after snow. And what's great about this is it really helps the municipality support with their green initiatives, which is coming down the line, whether we like it or not, right? Um, also in some states, there's already EPA compliance standards that they must abide by. So um, we have really brilliant customers doing good things. Uh, for powered assets, or I already did that, uh, for agriculture rather, um, the use cases are so varied and wide, asset recovery, uh, theft, uh, checking which rows granularly have been already harvested or uh, watered. And again, this reminds me of another really clever customer we have where they had integrated our device into the well pumps on uh, farms. 
And that doesn't sound exciting until you hear this. So we also built a custom application with it um, that allows farmers to automate their irrigation without sending anybody out. They can open their phone on the mobile app, push a button, turn the pump on and off. So I think we have the smartest customers in the biz. So those are the use cases for the top, you go. Right, and, and going from right to left as opposed to left to right, I'm gonna start with maintenance and compliance. And it's something that kind of lends to something Jody had said earlier about the salters. Um, the reason why they had to use the salters and measure it is for the EPA compliance, right? And, uh, and there's other compliances like that where you have fuel state uh, surcharges between counties, between states, um, and you need to know when things are on and when things are off. So think about like a generator. It doesn't tell you where it was on. It doesn't tell you when it was on. Normally you would have to use our GB130 type device so that you can identify when it was on, where it was at when it was on, so that you can get this fuel sur surcharge checks that you're supposed to be compliant with. Um, the other things are like high risk assets, something that uh, where we lend the most value is when you leave something where it should be, something big, heavy, and inanimate that you think, oh, nobody's gonna mess with that. And then you come back and you learn that it's gone. Well, then that's something that we can help cure as well. Um, the multi-site thing, this is something that leans into mostly uh, companies that have multiple job sites. Um, when you have equipment that's sprawled out, typically you know what you're doing. Your foremen know what they're doing, but sometimes at the upper levels, you're just like, hey, where's all our assets? And why do we have to rent something when we own that equipment on this other site? Um, it's, it's imperative that your accounting team is able to understand uh, where these things are at and where your project managers know how to access equipment. And this is really helpful when this is implemented. And so we integrate this stuff with ERP systems. We integrate it with other um, softwares that can help it, it, um, drive these types of solutions. And then of course, my, my, one of my personal favorite is a usage-based billing. So like rental companies and knowing when uh, something is being used and utilized and then what within their fleet is being uh, utilized and how often it's being utilized. When should they be cycling out certain things? Should they not buy this many things? It's really helpful in those data analytics at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at different levels, right? So not just the store level, but then you're thinking of the upper echelons when you're purchasing equipment or you're going to um, make strategic decisions about the rental and the fleets that are there. Now we're gonna dive into the devices, which is probably what most of you have been waiting for. So um, this would be the most popular device in the equipment sector for us. Uh, the GB620MG has an incredibly long battery, big battery, lasts up to three or four months at one ping a day. So it's quite often used on trailers because trailers will sit in a yard sometimes for months without getting connected to power. So you're not gonna lose that asset. Uh, it also has Bluetooth capability. So for cold chain, this is the number one go-to device, hands down. Um, they'll attach it to the trailer, the reefer, uh, and put a temperature sensor, Bluetooth temperature sensor inside the truck or flout three or four of them even, um, if it's a big reefer with multiple compartments. Um, so this is an amazing device for that use case as well. Uh, it has the interfaces you would expect for multiple inputs and outputs. You can actually even monitor two engines with one device here. So a lot of times equipment like cranes, for example, they have two engines. They have the engine that moves the crane around and then they have the engine on the actual crane for it to, to do its job. So you can monitor the engine hours on both engines with one device along with several inputs if you also wanted to, to keep track of the PTO for another arm and whatnot. So all around, uh, great device, very ruggedized. The mounting bracket too is built into the device. People love that, super simple. Um, and I think that's it. I'm not missing anything, I don't think. <laughs> right, and so that takes us to the GB130 device. This is a, this is a, um, one of my growing favorite devices because you can apply it to almost any device. And it's hard to say that about a device and really mean it, obviously. Uh, this is for powered assets, something with, uh, with a generator or a battery. Um, uh, this is something that can give you a, a virtual ignition detection, which is super important when you are trying to figure out when things are on and when things are off. You're trying to gauge the hours, the maintenance cycles, the MROs that, that, are, that could be attached to it. Um, 
and 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 of course it's waterproof uh, and ready to you know pretty rugged for the most part. Um, it has an, a other features that you couldn't expect from a black box. So think about the accelerometer side of it, crash detection behavior, tow alarms, anti jamming, and and Bluetooth mechanisms. So you could really expand this as much as as much or as little as you want, uh, and even connect it up to some Bluetooth stuff so that you know when a bucket is on a truck or when you know a piece of equipment is hooked up to a trailer, make sure that it's on the right trailer. Uh, things like that that I've seen uh, for this type of device and those in those Bluetooth use cases. So things like rental mar the rental market um, have used this uh, extensively to um, to keep things together on assets that they wouldn't normally attach a tracking device too. So think of like a floor sweeper or some kind of high value device or high value product that is just kind of hard to find a tracking device for. This would fit that bill. This would be that solution. Something you put on a loaner equipment or usage-based billing, it works out so well uh, for those customers that use it that way. Uh, the GV350 is the smartest device in our portfolio, a little smart event. So uh, this device can do so many things, uh, aside from CAN, so it does have J1939, J1708, also OBD2 um, with the CAN click, has multiple interfaces, so you can attach uh, one wire, a guide button, a driver IDs, um, it has the output for the input, rather, for RFID card readers, um, and it's all around, probably, the de my go-to device actually for any kind of complicated project, that's the device I'm choosing. Um, it's just amazing, all the interfaces, Bluetooth, et cetera. So I use this on uh, solutions, like I said, that might require a driver ID with a card reader and Bluetooth sensors and, you know, and it's just a beast of a device. It can handle it all and do it all well. Right, and the GL502 is uh, my go-to device sometimes for um, for trailer tracking or, or just these slap and track options that people just need a, a, a ruggedized device. This is a great 10-year device if you're pinging out one time a day. Um, a ruggedized case at IP68, that means it's waterproof, mud-proof. You put it on these uh, heavy equipment type machines, uh, but you can also put it on something like, like you see here where you have a sign trailer um, these things get lost, uh, not lost, just misplaced. Nobody's really stealing these things. They're just misplacing them and it happens all the time. Uh, and they're not cheap. Uh, so putting a tracking device helps give you, gives you visibility across the land of where these things are at. Um, and not just these things, but other things as well. Um, you typically find them on, on trailer, again, trailer tracking, cargo containers. Um, and it's really to, to just monitor things. I think some things that people don't realize that this device has is you know optional Bluetooth stuff, right? So think of a beacon mm -hmm. uh, situation where you have this centralized into one spot and you have a bunch of beacons out in the field and when they're nearby, you just wanna know that they're safe and sound. Um, so typically it, you would put this at a, like a job site, um, a construction job site, make sure things aren't growing feet and walking away. One of the biggest uh, things that walks away on a construction site is generators. I keep saying generators over and over throughout this presentation because it's one of the one of the pieces of equipment I think is over is overlooked. Um, but of course, they're not the easiest to find, and nobody wants to spend you know uh, uh, a bunch of money trying to protect these things. But when you're thinking about Bluetooth, you think about um, all of our devices in general because they all, in some way, shape, or form, you can find any one of them that has Bluetooth, and you can create solutions that are either a fixed solution or like this one's a wireless solution. And you can really identify when things are moving closer to the door and getting off site. And you can make that, you can uh, affect some type of action uh, before that actually happens. Uh, in this case, in this GL502, um, you're looking at scheduled reportings. You have OTA control over the air control, I'm sorry, uh, motion detection. Um, and then of course, uh, mounting features. There's a built-in bracket on this, just like the GV620 device. Um, but there's also magnetic mounting features. And so that's been uh, very, very helpful for a lot of our customers in the field. So this is the new solution I mentioned earlier for asset recovery with the thieves, like I said, getting smarter and smarter every day. Uh, so what we did is we paired two devices together and 
if those two devices are not within proximity of each other, uh, it will send an alarm notifying you so you can go recover your asset. Essentially what was happening, the reason this was created, uh, thieves are getting smart. They know where to look for these wired devices. So they have the ability to find them and remove them very quickly. So what we do is we have a ghost device. Uh, you hide it somewhere, very good. We have a magnetic mount that's really helpful too. So you can hide it darn near anywhere that you would think you know, thieves wouldn't look. Uh, and as soon as that Bluetooth or that ghost device doesn't sense the primary device, it will wake up and send an alarm and say, hey, something's going on. Our device is gone, our buddy's gone. So it's a really creative, unique solution um, to kind of combat the advancements of thievery, if you will. Right, and and the blue, and this drives us into the Bluetooth accessories and, um, uh, you know, everything, anything is possible with Bluetooth, it's just, do you want it to actually happen? Uh, we have key fobs that help do uh, driver ID. They can work as, as emergency buttons. They can be programmed as, as you wish uh, for them to operate. Uh, again, there's a um, different IO extenders that we have. We have the temperature humidity um, sensors and the Bluetooth beacons that have quite a, quite a long effective range. And, I, and I'd have to, get, I'd have to um, lean over to our, to our FAE team to, to see what the tests have come out with. Um, but I've tested it myself. I know that it's a, a very good long, at long range. Um, and so it's become a pretty reliable solution because it's built on 5.1 and 5.2. It just really depends on the protocols and the use case applications. Uh, but that being said, um, we have other applications as well, such as the BLE door sensor. I've been seeing this as a very popular option for reefer trucks, right? So what we want to do is just track when that door is open and how long it's been open. If it's been open for a long time, let's send an alarm, let's um, send somebody out there to close that door. And it may not seem like something that is obvious, but people, this happens all the time, uh, especially within that industry. Um, the other one is a CAN, uh, is a CAN bus reader for, uh, to enable uh, connectivity for CAN bus uh, applications uh, over Bluetooth. Um, I know we have a wired one, Jody will touch on that one in just a second. Um, of course, there's uh, tire pressure uh, monitoring, monitoring systems uh, for an internal, external systems. Uh, and we've seen, we've seen a little bit of popularity between that as well uh, and connecting with our devices as well. And so these are additional accessories that are not Bluetooth, but they're our, our standard traditional one wire serial RS-232 accessories. Um, we obviously have the one wire temperature sensor. That's a standard, I think, in any portfolio. Uh, the I button readers, the RFID card readers are becoming more popular um, as of late, which is exciting. So we have one customer who actually cleverly uh, decided to use the I button for driver ID and use the RFID card reader for trash cans so that the trash company could go by and get a geo stamp of when exactly the trash was dumped. So a lot of different use cases there. Um, for the ultrasonic fuel sensors, that's important because well, one, if you are in the petroleum business, right, you're gonna need to know, uh, validate if you will, but also just for fuel theft, right? I think it's interesting uh, how much fuel gets stolen every year. Uh, and the CAN 100 is for the devices that might not have a, like the GV350, it supports natively um, heavy duty, 1939-1708. But if you wanted to do that for uh, a lightweight, heavy, you know, a lightweight vehicle rather, and you want OBD too, then you would uh, connect it to this accessory and it will pull through the OBD2 codes for you, the standard codes. We also have the RS-232 camera, the driver, um, monitoring camera, but we actually have a new camera that we didn't really go on in this um, webinar, but it's the CV200. It's going to be an amazing camera, so keep your eyes out. Um, and then for other accessories, I really like that Quecklink uh, delivers really niche industry specific, like we take care of our customers. If you need something, we're going to build it. Um, so we have like concrete drum rotation sensors, you know, if we have a large concrete company, um, they need to know the viscosity of the concrete is at the right uh, or the right viscosity rather they need to make sure that drum is still rotating and some of those older older concrete trucks don't have you know the way to do that without putting eyes on it. So um, we have the panic buttons the relays for remote disable remote disable also is just like a standard but if folks don't know you can remotely 
disable uh, the vehicle if it's ever stolen or maybe an authorized driver, uh, whatever it may be. And we have some really helpful installation tips um, in that regard too on how to install the relay, uh, for example, like on the on the fuel pump instead of the ignition so you don't kill people. Anyway. Okay. And that's and that uh, brings us down to all this, all these wonderful things that you see, and you, and you're just trying to figure out and wrap your head around it, and go, man, how am I going to support this in the field? How are <laughs> we going to manage this? And QuickLink does a great thing. They provide a QuickLink management server uh, that that's, um, I'll, and I'll point it out. It's hosted by the user. It's not hosted by us, um, but we are there to help you support it. Um, we obviously give you a license so that you're. You know, when you're using our products, you're able to get some the, the high fidelity uh, visibility that you need um, with an easy interface that allows you to do file management and enables you to do group uh, to group devices and to really just understand what's out there in the field. So if you have six different groups of devices that have different configurations that you want, you know, one of them reading once a day, some of them reading three times a day or one is always on and it's giving breadcrumbs, you want to be able to manage different models, different uh, you know, firmwares, understand what configurations are out there. And this is a great tool for any one of our, um, any one of our uh, customers that are, that are really moving devices out there in the field and they want a very quick and easy way to be able to manage what's out there in real time, this is perfect. This is a, a great solution that enables you to identify what SIM cards are on which devices. It'll report back. I mean, obviously it depends on, on, on uh, the circumstance, um, but different models require different firmwares and you wanna know which kinds of, uh, what versions of uh, what you know, configurations and I've already said, um, but it's a wonderful way to, to be able to have quick and easy access. And, and really, uh, if you had a, a, a string of configurations that you want to change, instead of sending it over SMS, you can do all this stuff over the air. So the OTA component of this is what really drives value here. And of course, we're here and our entire teams are here to help you get set up, um, but also to keep you, keep you moving uh, over time. And so, wow, that's that's really that's kind of the end of it, I guess. Uh, we have uh, so many different ways to work with Quicklink. Of course, you can always email us at sales at quicklink.com. Uh, you can reach out to Jody Ward directly as our channel sales manager, she or director. I'm sorry, uh, she will point you in the right direction and get you started. Jody has had a tremendous uh, wealth of knowledge within our within our each one of our products product segments because. She has helped certify her devices with every carrier uh, here in the United States. So she's touched them all. She's been through a lot of different use cases. Um, I lean on her for uh, some of the most complicated things and some, some of the biggest solutions that you can that you can find. She supports uh, all the carriers directly, um, and so I'm very just so very proud of uh, having uh, somebody like Jody on our team. Um, of course, if you're looking for a solution, you can always go to one of our distributors. Uh, we have distribution points with Core. Uh, Core Wireless and Core Telematics has been uh, a, a uh, a, not just a reseller, but a distributor of our products, and they typically have stuff in stock. Um, big shout out to Asset and Fleet, who always keep stuff in stock, and they have a great uh, portfolio. Yes. If you need something, uh, they can just send it to you. You can visit them online um, and just buy it online if you need a quick sample or, or something. Um, of course, you can always reach out to me. I know my, my email is not on there, but it's basically my first and last name. Um, of course, you can always become a partner, and that's something that um, that we're looking for in the next coming years is to build our ecosystem of partners, um, value-added resellers, and uh, stocking distributors. Um, so, with that, I think um, we'll we'll take we'll open it up for some Q and A. So. I guess I'm going to go to the chat. The Q&A was. Uh... Yeah, I'm going to go to the chat because I'm, I'm, right. <laughs> I've, I've totally turned it off because I was um, I was trying to focus and I, I get distracted. Um, I know, right? So let's start at the top. Um, okay. We have a couple questions that came in. Um, I think one of them was from uh, from Dennis about DTC codes. Um, uh, oh, are you talking about OBD2, Dennis? 
I'm, it reads all the standard DTT or DTC codes with the can click with the can uh, accessory. Um, so it won't pick up proprietary. Some manufacturers have proprietary codes. Right. But, but all the standards, it will. Yeah. On the standard stuff, I think Jody hit it right on the money. We will we will read some of the standard stuff. If you tell us and you give us some requirements of what you're looking for at DTC, we can totally work it out um, and, and help you support that um, and even investigate the, the, the uh, protocols that are required. Um, typically, when we're working with customers that have unique devices, think forklifts, um, think outside the box kind of stuff, um, we would work with them uh, to see where we can capture it. Um, of course, sometimes it's licensing fees and things that we have to um, figure out. But at some point in time, uh, we do a pretty good job of uh, ironing out the details and then uh, presenting the solution. And Dennis also, I'm sorry, I read your first question, not your second one. Uh, for Dennis, uh, you can add, if you know the PGN, um, and PGN stands for parameter group number and heavy equipment talk jargon. Um, if you know the PGN of your custom, you know, that you're trying to get, you can add that into the device. So anyway, right. moving on. Next question. I hope we answered it. And if not, Dennis, feel free to reach out and you can reach out to Jody directly. Um, uh, the, to, does it support NFC? Um, we support RFID, um, but NFC is um, not, I would say it's not supported. <laughs> Um, the, it just depends on what protocol, because NFC is right. very relatable to RFID, um, and there's some protocols that we do support and others that we don't. But I'd love to hear the use case if you have one. Um, so don't let that discourage you from reaching out. I think we could we could find a solution that works for you. Um, a soft SIM supported by devices. Um, we're working on it. That's uh, that is something that we are actively working on. Um, I know that there's been a push in eSIM. Uh, and we're capable of doing it with a lot of devices, but I think what we're trying to find is um, uh, is is the right um, process for working with um, with those eSIM providers and the soft SIM providers. Um, we are working through that now, and it is on our roadmap. Uh, probably within the next few months, I would suspect that we would um, lock that down and make some announcements. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself on that. But the answer is today we don't have the soft SIM embedded or able, available in our current solution, but we are working on it. Uh, the next question is, what is the best OBD choice for heavy equipment? Um, that's gonna be the, that's the GV350, right, Jody? I'm gonna, Correct. I'm gonna go out on a limb there and say that. Yeah. Um, you have a high, a high and a low can with the, GV, with the GV350. Um, it, there's so many uh, ins and outs for, for just, uh, you know, the PTO side of it. And I think that's where, uh, that's where the tremendous value comes into play for heavy equipment is just having that power takeoff information available. And you have a personal tracker. Um, one gentleman asked if we have a personal tracker. We do. It's the GL320 and it is designed for people tracking, if you will. Uh, a lot of lone worker use cases, utility pull, um, workers has fall detection and a panic button and it is a very popular device so yes absolutely and a sample success business case from each application case that's a lot of work Ramon <laughs> that is a lot of work um, like, for every single application case I thought I did a good job on the use case slide maybe I didn't I didn't uh, detail enough customers no, you, did. you did great so Ramon we have so many different things I think you should reach out to us um, and we're happy to happy to to, to exercise that uh, those use cases. But I mean, we've we've done we've had such a great impact. And in fact, we just won the Globy Awards for the agriculture uh, our agriculture solution uh, utilizing the GB one thirty MG. Um, so uh, that's 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 great. I think we also uh, won the um, we, we have win a ton of awards, but just recently uh, named for that as well. Um, uh, but overall, use case wise, it's just so sprawling. You can't just pick one. Um, I thank you so much for asking this que these questions. They, they kind of put me on the fence on, on this one. That's hard to do. Um, I think we have one more question that just came in. It's OBD, uh, heavy equipment differences in sizes, the regular cars. So is it the GV350 that's going to work? 
Yes, it will work. Yeah, I can answer that quickly. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'll show you how. Reach out to me, and I'll get your array uh, set up depending on the type of vehicle it is. Yeah, and one thing that I've seen, uh, um, Mohammed, on that one, it, with the GV three hundred and fifty, you can either they use it for heavy equipment, and with the can click, you can use it with the vehicle. Um, some people just want to buy one device across their entire fleet. And, and they just have that one accessory to make it compatible across their entire fleet. So thank you so much for asking that question. It was a good one. And with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Hi, uh, I thank you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.